Friday and it was always a very, very difficult period. So I'm going to work to try and lift us out of our suffering and think about what it is we can do to make a difference in this work. And the work we're talking about is teacher stress but also teacher well-being. And I don't think we should talk about one without the other because stress and burnout and the things which are problematic and difficult about being a teacher are also part of the same thing that makes teaching such a wonderful and amazing profession. And the influence that you have on your students and on the people that you see every day is absolutely massive. Slide please. So, I'm going to start by talking about teacher identity. I know I'm adding to the language soup by giving you the language of England, and as some of you will pick up, I'm from Manchester, but spent much of my career working in New Zealand. And I worked in a school in Leeds, much like Fatima's. So I have experiences of how that goes in terms of what happens in the classroom. And I can tell you, by this time on a Friday, chairs going out the window were not an unusual experience. So teacher identities and collective teacher identities are formed and are changing. They're changing because our experience of the world is changing, what's coming into our classroom is changing, and the identities of our students are changing. Naturally, this is going to have an effect on the teaching profession. I will also reference the fact that I've been told by my colleagues here that under 30 you only have 300 teachers in the country, which for me is a phenomenal statistic. 130. That 130. Even less. Even, uh, uh, for me, that is a statistic, and being a research coordinator, statistics are important to me, is a statistic which speaks volumes about the way teacher identities work in this country. So I think we should be having an open conversation about that as well, about how you renew the profession when you have a government that is not writing the policies which allow you to move the profession in a, a more open and rejuvenating direction. So that's a conversation I know that you are having here with FENPROF, and I know they are having with the government but it is a time that the government woke up and took notice. I will also say that teacher professionalism has many systemic influences. There is not just one thing that shapes the profession of the teacher in the classroom. It is the identities of the students, it's the identities of the parents, it's the policies that are falling down upon you, it is the economic situation that happened in 2008 that began in the Anglophone countries in the United States and in England and you go to those countries now and you don't see the same pain and the same suffering that you see in Spain or Portugal now that to me seems unjust and there must be a response from the international education community that understands and takes that into account I will say that I wear my badge with pride and I would thank our colleague for lending it to me because I too am part of this movement that we work together to resist. We do not just sit and complain, we also act and I know that you are acting in this moment around those identities that are being framed. Now the next point about teachers needing to set their own standards I acknowledge that in English we talk about professional standards and having teachers setting them, but in Portugal you have a different cultural tradition around the framing of that word. So we have translated it for you in a way that we think is most accurate, but that is a conversation that I'm happy to engage with you on over a longer period of time, because we are setting standards with UNESCO, a framework that we believe every teacher's union should be at the centre of. I think teachers must also be supported 
by good initial teacher education, that is teacher training, but that's not the whole job because you must have professional learning and development throughout your career and it must come in ways that work for you as well as for the school and the government. It can't be a one-way street with people telling you what you must learn. If I was in the back of the year 10 class and my teacher said to me, you must learn this, and there was no engagement with the student around what they're learning and why they're learning, I'd have a problem. And it's the same for teachers being told, this is what you have to look at. Only the results of the students, only what is going to get me a better set of results in the school, only which will have a positive impact on PISA. That's not enough. Career pathways must be varied and coherent. So your career pathways work here as part of a bigger picture. You have a democratic tradition in Portugal which says that you should have democracy in the school around the way those career pathways work. Many have lost the ability to influence in that way in the school. That's something worth fighting for and I know it's a fight that the union are engaged with. Teachers must also help shape curriculum and well-being policies. I work on the OECD 2030 work with one of your secretaries, Joanne Costa, excuse my pronunciation, but um, so I do work with him around that work, but he must be working with you because he cannot, in a ministry office, understand what is happening in your classroom. And that's a conversation that we need to keep open. Slide, thanks. Um, well-being and stress was something looked at by the NASUWT before this survey you have. They didn't have 18,000 responses and I do want to acknowledge what an achievement this survey is. But they got the ball rolling at Education International around this idea. They found that in the last 12 months of their job, 77% of teachers had experienced anxiety, 85% had suffered loss of sleep, 22% had increased their use of alcohol, 9% had suffered a relationship breakdown, and 3% of teachers self-harm. Self-harm is on the end of the bell curve. There is so much happening in the middle that we also need to acknowledge. And I'm going to talk about that with a Japanese reference as we go through. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> in the same survey, 96% believe they encounter students who are experiencing mental health issues. The mental health problem in England is absolutely huge. Now, I don't know the statistics for Portugal, but I know this problem is European-wide that actually the number of pupils who say they are exhibiting anxiety or panic attacks was at 92%. 80% were claiming some form of depression and 67% were self-harming in some way. Nearly two-thirds say they are not confident that they or their school would be able to get the timely support from expert services and CAMS as an acronym for the services for mental health support for young people, for students experiencing mental health problems. So if you have a problem in your classroom, who do you refer it to? What are the resources placed around the teacher? How does the school work as a hub so that services operate around it? And over half, 51%, say staff numbers at their school have decreased, have gone down in the last two years, with nearly two-thirds, that is 65%, saying they're not able to give students as much individual attention in lessons due to the loss of support staff and other support people in the school. Students are not always taught by a teacher trained for the subject or the age range due to loss of teaching staff. 
And I will tell you that in Holland, right now, this week, there are many schools only opening four days a week because they don't have enough teachers to open for a complete whole five-day week. Holland is not the poorest country in Europe. It does have resources to pay teachers, but it doesn't have policy that is providing for a career that is attractive to young people and that is getting the right number of people involved. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk now about our survey. So we've done a survey called the Status of Teachers Survey. It is available in English, French and Spanish, not Portuguese, I'm afraid, because it's not a language necessarily, it's not a, one of the official languages of EI, but the Spanish hopefully will give you some help. Um, global Status of Teachers in the Teaching Profession was done by Nellie Stromquist, who is an academic in Maryland, in consultation with me and my team. It's a triennial survey of 32.5 million teachers, which we have in EI. That's 401 affiliates in 179 countries and territories, including many you know, Cape Verde, etc., Angola. Um, JTU report on teacher stress, I'm going to come to a little later because it will blow your socks off, is a phrase we use in English. 57% of unions only sometimes consulted on pedagogical practices, curriculum development, assessment practices and school organisation. So we are talking about many countries saying this is what happens in the school without ever talking to a teacher about it. Now how can you plan what is going to happen in your classrooms without talking to you? Because it's somebody sat in an office, disengaged, without the right information on what's happening on the ground. And I've just done some work with 12 countries in Africa, including Cape Verde and Mozambique, who were talking about the reality of what happens in their classroom. And they have governments saying, you must do continuous professional learning and development, and it's happening in two or three schools in the country. So they have much bigger problems, but they're the same problems that we have everywhere in the world. It's the right level of support, the right level of resourcing, the right level of concentration, and teacher-centred policies. If we can change the slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. There's a global crisis around teacher supply. There's not enough trained and qualified teachers to go round. So just as you have this problem here in Portugal of young teachers, there is a problem around the world of getting enough qualified teachers into the system. Conditions of work make a difference. So the number of hours that you are teaching, the number of meetings that you are called to after school, the number of times you have to come in on a Saturday to do extra things that are not part of your 35-hour week are having an impact on who wants to become a teacher. And our report said 69% report that the teaching profession is not attractive to young people. And I know my children, when I say to them, what about becoming a teacher, look at me and laugh and say, Martin, you must be joking. 79% report teacher salaries are less than for professions of similar qualifications. I want to highlight these two sectors, and I know we've got our vocational and education person here, Technical vocational education and training, which is that track that trains plumbers and mechanics and all the people I can never find in Brussels when I really need them, they are very crucial to our system. The G20 has recognised that, the OECD has recognised that, yet they earn less than everybody else. And it's the same for early childhood. 
So there is a big focus on these two sectors at the moment. Thanks. So JTU, I said I was going to come back to the Japanese. These statistics are phenomenal. So we found in our survey that a large scale survey con conducted by the Japanese who are part of our network told us that reproductive health rights found that 41% of women teachers, 41% considered that their working environment affected their experiences with pregnancy and childbirth. 20% of those expecting a child reported maternity disorders. Defined as morning sickness, threatened miscarriage, threatened premature delivery, swelling and high blood pressure. This high proportion of maternity disorders suggests that women teachers experience a very stressful working environment in Japan. And in Japan, they work on average 68 hour weeks. So the amount of work that is going on in that system is unhealthy. The JTU also reports extreme stress among teachers related to excessive workloads including required volunteer work at home and in after school activities. Now, I've just come back from Korea and in Korea you have students sat in a classroom for 17 hours a day. So they get to school at 8 a.m. and they go home at 9 p.m. at night. Some at 10 and many will go to crammers after that. So another after school after school where they're trying to get more educational advantage. These are systems that score high on PISA in maths in particular, but very low on the same study on well-being. So I'm going to get back to well-being now. Well-being and stress. The link between your well-being and the well-being of society cannot be underestimated. These are not separate things. How you feel and how our teachers who have spoken here today feel is reflective of the whole of Portugal. It is not just about individuals because your experience is a community experience and the experience of our young people going into your schools. Andrea Schleicher, who many of us love to hate, but I work with quite a lot, and he does believe that teachers are the most important thing in schools. I don't agree with everything he says, but on that he is absolutely firm. And he does believe that teacher unions are critical. There are other political things he gets up to I won't go into. But he has said in his book, and if you can get hold of it, his book is worth reading, came out this year. He stresses the ability teachers possess to have a positive influence on students' life chances. You can make the difference for students. And many of you, I'm sure, like me, will have students who gave them a really hard time in the classroom, Facebooking them ten years later, saying, Oh, I was a bit mean to you, sir, but I really thought about the things you were saying to me and they've made a big difference for me down the track. We don't always know the influence we have. Equity, for me, is the name of the game. We need to make working class kids, kids who are marginalised, vulnerable and oppressed, have better opportunities because it is not fair the way education works right now. Some examples that Schleicher gives, and he is a Sinophile, I said I was going to say this, I don't know the translation in Portuguese, but he, it means that he loves China, like being a Francophile, you love France. I'm sure there's no Anglophiles here, because we've got Brexit, but that's <laughs> another story. China and Singapore are examples he gives that are really strong countries that make a difference to the poor kids in their system. And we need to look at the policies they use. For yourselves, I think Canada is the easiest comparison 
because culturally there are similarities in terms of European influence, etc. And they place the best teachers in the most difficult schools, they pay them money to do it, and they support them in the process. You can't just drop people there and walk away, because it doesn't work. We know that. So you need to have a government that wraps around those schools. Every country must deal with that equity in their own way. And I would suggest, having been talking to Manuela about your situation, you need to do this in a democratic way because you have a tradition and a culture of democratic education as a result of the revolution that needs to be reinvigorated. So holistic school communities, I believe in holistic education. So it's not just one thing we're looking at. It's not just teacher results, student results. It's about the whole student, the whole teacher, the whole staff, and the whole community. We must have whole school approaches. This is where your democratic tradition is so strong. Everybody working together to make a difference. OECD, to be fair to them, have recognised the importance of well-being. So it's increased in focus at that organisation. The 2030 OECD has a curriculum focus that has well-being in the middle. But I will be saying to Joanne when I see him in two weeks' time, what about the well-being of your teachers? Because you can't just have an idea about the well-being of your students without understanding the well-being of your teachers. We talk about that in that piece of work. PISA and TALIS now have well-being questions and there is a well-being and stress supplementary option for PISA in 2021 that you should be talking to the government about getting Portugal into because countries are shying back saying we don't want to find this information because we're worried about what we might find. But once you have that, with OECD and Schleicher's name on it, you can give it back to the government and say, this is what this survey tells us. We need a more balanced classroom experience. Students who achieve the highest scores do not necessarily report as being the happiest. I've already talked about the Korean example. Um, so, well-being. Um, I've already talked about the academic achievement bit, so I'll jump over that. Increases in student anxiety and negative human responses to over-testing are absolutely clear. If you test, 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 and in America they call it kill and drill education, which many of the charter schools use, it's not good and it doesn't work. Crowded curriculum doesn't work either. I've talked about JTU, I'll jump over that. Go on to the next slide. I'm aware of time and I want to give you a chance to talk as well. So active citizens, if we're going to present, prevent and stop Bolsonaro type scenarios in Europe, sorry my pronunciation I'm sure is, is terrible, sorry. Yes. But, but the, the man is certainly worse. And if we are going to stop that, we must have active citizens. Because if we don't train our students to understand what it is to be in a democracy and to be active about our democracy, how do we protect against it? I'm talking there about the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, which the UN have developed. We need cooperative skills for our students and our teachers, creative thinking, as Christoph has already talked about, and empathy for the person over here and the person over here. And if I can't have empathy for my colleagues and the people around me, for my students, and the system doesn't have empathy for me, I've got a problem. So we need coherence in PLD, curriculum, and the whole school approach. This again is about PLD, and I want to talk here about time. 
because Finland, which has one of the highest results in the OECD, has one of the lowest hours of classroom delivery. They do not teach all day long. They do not do what Korea does. They work limited hours, they shot early, and teachers work together. And you have a government asking you to work harder. You say, hang on, we need time to teach. And you can't teach without the time required to work with your colleagues. And if I couldn't talk to Manuela before I started this presentation, I wouldn't be able to deliver as I can. We have to find time for each other in the classroom. And that means teaching less hours. It's always popular with governments, I don't think, but it's true. <laughs> okay. Time engaging with administrivia as an English um, portmanteau is the, fr is the French, but it's a portmanteau word, you know, it's been bashed together. But it's that administration and trivia, and many systems, Portugal, Korea is exactly the same, they have to fill in so much paper. We need to get rid of that. We are professionals. We're university educated. We are shaping the lives of our future generations. We need to be spending our time doing that, not on filling in bits of paper and ticking boxes. We are not technicists, we're professionals. And this is where autonomous professionalism come in, comes in. I want to repeat that this conference you're at right now, FENPROF, your union, is leading you in professional learning and development that is connected to you as a classroom teacher. Is the government doing the same? I doubt it. So you need to have that conversation with government, that you put your money where your mouths are, your union puts their money where their mouths are, it's time the government did the same thing. And they need to listen to you because teachers know what works best. Right, I'm going to skip over leadership because I'm sick of hearing about school leaders. I want to know about teachers. So if you've got questions about that, come back to me. Every teacher is a leader. You shut that classroom door and who is leading in the classroom? Well, mostly it was me, but some last period Friday, it was Ian Wright on the back row who was throwing all the books around. But that's not the ideal model. We want the teacher to be the leader. Every teacher is a leader. Every teacher needs the support to do it. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Teacher status. Oh, no, we've jumped. To go back one, please. Yeah. Teacher status. So teachers and their unions have been made by the government, and I will reference your previous free female Secretary of State, whose name I don't know, but you know who she is. She was making you the block to learning in the classroom. Now, that is the dumbest policy position I have ever heard of. Yeah, the minister, even worse. So you are the future of schools. Everybody knows that. Schleicher knows that. We know that. The students know that. To have a minister working against you in that way is a nightmare. Just be glad you've woken up and that you can at least start having the next phase. But you must try and avoid those ministers at all costs. And I know your union fought to bring her down. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell when you've got a unionist speaking rather than an academic because we hit slightly different notes. But I couldn't do the job without them, that's for sure, because they give us the information that we need. Um, Schleicher says countries must commit to making teaching an attractive possession, profession both intellectually and financially with strong investment in teacher development and good working conditions. Now I know that he comes here often. Why aren't we seeing policies that follow that through? That's your job is to push that um, argument. 
Yet teachers in many countries feel a low level of professional autonomy and an average degree of autonomy and decision making. So you've got the idea that you have the status to do your job, but if you can't make the decision in the classroom at the point of need, you have a problem. I've just got two slides about what I think you should be thinking about. So this is part one. As I've already said, you've got to reduce teaching time so you can focus on quality learning, as the Finnish do. You've got to give teachers greater control over educational decisions within the classroom by balancing their educational knowledge with peer networks and professional autonomy. That comes out of the book Supporting Teacher Professionalism, written by the OECD, based on the TALIS 2013 survey results. It's a very strong piece of work, came out in 2015, says exactly what we think. Those three are important, they must all be supported by policies. Teachers and their unions, that's you, have to have a say about all policies related to teacher well-being, student well-being, as well as the situations of crossover for both. Part two, as involving teachers and their unions is crucial, I've already talked about that. I want to stress this, finding more time with teachers within the working day to do your peer learning and having networks that are developed and supported by the state so that you can do that is critical. You've got to find some advocacy pathways to make that happen. Three here, supporting teachers about well-being related pedagogy. Now, we have got more mental health issues in the classroom now than we had when I was at school. Now, how are we going to deal with that as teachers without professional focused support from those who know? So what do I do with a student when they're cutting? What do I do with a student who writes a note that makes me really worried about them? Do I have a counsellor in the school that I can refer them to? I'm an English and drama teacher. It's not my job to understand everything about the student, but I care. And I need to know where to send that student and what to do. You need support in well-being related pedagogy. And it can't be done by passing you a piece of paper saying, you will care for the students now. It's got to be more than that, and it's got to be wraparound support. And I'll just finish by saying that teacher union leadership should be supported at all levels of the system. In the branch, in the region, in the state, and you need to keep pushing to make that happen. Thanks for listening and for being engaged after lunch.